subscribe tag tv youtube channel and press the notification button people have to live in in unity we are still in transition civil society has been decimated of course we rely on media and i think the government has not done enough the international community has failed to respond no place in the world is perfect the yoga event is held here severe injustice and they should be stopped we should raise our voices condemn this uh, brutal act Hello viewers welcome to news week south asia a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on south asian nations let's begin with the headlines first terror infiltration bed into jammu and kashmir foiled massive tunnel exposed terrorism is like a cancer that impacts all of humanity says indian foreign minister and Afghanistan releases more Taliban prisoners to pave way for peace talks The terrorists based in Pakistan occupied Kashmir have been using different tactics to infiltrate into union territory of Jammu and Kashmir with the aim to target the Indian security forces and create fear psychosis among the people These terrorists do infiltration attempts with the help of Pakistan army. Recently, a transborder tunnel along the international border was detected by the Indian security forces which clearly indicate active infiltration attempts by Pakistan based terrorists at the border. A report. This tunnel detected in Jammu Samba district traces its way back to Pakistan. The sandbags bearing the markings of Karachi tell the wicked tale of Islamabad aided terrorist infiltration activities along the international border. The exposure was made on August 29 when the Indian border forces found a hidden tunnel along the LOC. Based on intelligence inputs, the security forces launched a search operation in the area, after which a tunnel extending 150 to 160 yards into Jammu and Kashmir originating from Pakistan was found along the sandbags with markings of Pakistan on them this tunnel is about 150 meters long so far which has been detected uh, starting from the pakistan site uh, it's about 25 feet uh, the depth of the tunnel and uh, the dia of the tunnel is about 2 feet by 2 feet and when we look at the opening of the tunnel on the indian side uh, it has been uh, very strongly uh, reinforced by using the sandbags and the sandbags have got the markings of uh, pakistan like karachi sakargarh uh, and some names of the factories uh, to which these sandbags belong are also indicated on those uh, sandbags there have been regular intelligence reports about the presence of a large number of terrorists across the border as they have already completed their training in the terror camps and are waiting for an opportune moment to sneak into Jammu and Kashmir failing to push these terrorists into indian side from traditional methods of cross border firing pakistan army has now resorted to underground means of pushing in ultras jammu and kashmir police have confirmed the role of pakistan establishment in such tunnel makings suggesting that this kind of appropriate designing of the tunnel using sandbags cannot be done without the help of pakistan army the sandbags that are there they have shakargarh and karachi markings on them now this sandbags has had two fold uh, utilization one was to shore up the entrance of the tunnel so that it would not collapse and no one would get to know that there is a tunnel over here and second was that they, they were used to ferry out the mud that was they excavated from here and empty it out into the pakistan land now this shows there is a direct link between one the pakistani rangers second the isi which plans this and third the pakistan government because all this thing this sort of a tunnel could never be made without the active connivance of 
the Pakistani Rangers, the ISI and the Pakistan Army and of course the Pakistan government. This is not the first time when a tunnel has been identified in the region. In fact, terrorists from Pakistan have been frequently using such underground paths to enter into Jammu and Kashmir in the last few years. Moreover, it has been observed that besides LOC, Samba and Hiranagar sectors along the IB have been favorite infiltration routes for Pakistan-sponsored terrorists. Masood Azhar's nephew, Omar Farooq, a key player in Pulwama bombing, had also infiltrated from Samba sector in Feb 2018 using a tunnel. However, efforts of alert border security force troops deployed in multi-tiered counter-infiltration grid have once again foiled the evil design of terrorists in deep collusion with the Pakistan establishment. This tunnel they made just to send in their men and material undetected into the Indian territory so that then they could create mayhem. And this is not the first time this has happened because this is the fourth tunnel that has been discovered by the Indian authorities. And therefore, we see that Pakistan is now hell-bent to go underground like and send their militants like rats into the Indian territory. On their course of dismantling terror routes and terror networks from all fronts, Indian security forces also neutralized at least 11 terrorists in successive gun battles in Pulwama and Shopia districts of Kashmir. The operation comes at a time when terrorists have intensified attacks on village council members and other leaders in Kashmir. Five have been shot dead in the past three months, prompting police to move thousand village leaders to high security zones. Frustrated by the rapid development and prevailing peace in Jammu and Kashmir, Pakistan is using all tricks in its book to unleash violence in the region, but vigilant Indian security forces have been successfully thwarting all its mischievous agendas. New Delhi has been constantly raising the issue of terrorism emanating from Pakistan and seeking world's attention for a collective mechanism to fight against this menace. In a recently held virtual seminar, India's Minister of External Affairs S.J. Shankar drew parallels between COVID-19 pandemic and the threat of terrorism and urged the global community to come together to dismantle the structures supporting terrorism in the same manner in which it is confronting the threat caused by the novel coronavirus pandemic. A report. While the world is still combating the threat of COVID-19 with the hopes of having a vaccine soon, a massive threat called terrorism continues to prevail with no solution in sight. At the 19th Darbari State Memorial Lecture held virtually on 28th August, India's External Affairs Minister S.J. Shankar talked about the contemporary challenges that have overwhelmed the present global society and the need to have a holistic approach to deal with them. Talking about the challenge of terrorism, Jay Shankar said it is a cancer that impacts all of humanity just like a pandemic. Terrorism was not born on 9-11, nor has the COVID been the only pandemic. We have long known intellectually that terrorism is a cancer that potentially affects everyone, just as pandemics potentially impact all humanity. And yet, in both cases, globalized focus response to either challenge have tended to emerge only when there has been sufficient disruption created by a spectacular event. Owing to the unconditional support of Islamabad, terrorists have been able to carry out several gruesome attacks on Indian soil. Incidents like the 2005 Delhi bombings 26-11 Mumbai attacks and the 2019 Pulwama CRPF attack have cumulatively claimed more than 200 lives in India. Taking an indirect jibe at Pakistan, Jay Shankar slammed the country for being the exporter of terrorists and dramatically calling themselves a victim of terror. All the while, States that have turned the production of terrorists into a primary export have attempted, 
by the dint of bland denials to paint themselves also as victims of terror. Pakistan establishment recently came across a major embarrassment when it had to publicly accept the presence of the most wanted terrorist and the proprietor of the D company, Daud Ibrahim, in its official list of banned 88 terrorists, which was issued in compliance with the notification of the United Nations Security Council. Noting this development, S.J. Shankar pointed out that sustained pressure through international mechanisms has eventually compelled a state to grudgingly acknowledge the presence of wanted terrorists and organized crime leaders on its territory. Hinting at Pakistan, he slammed such states for aiding, abetting, training and directing terror groups and associated criminal syndicates. Experts also believe that international pressure has pushed Islamabad in taking up counter-terrorism measures that have eventually exposed its terror policies. With the, uh, uh, the compulsions made on them by the international community, they have taken certain uh, steps which has exposed their long-time terror problems and they are exporting terrorists and they have terrorists within and India has been the prime victim of that terror. But now once their actions are seen internationally, the world community is now getting together and Pakistan has been exposed widely for it. While India has been consistently raising concerns over Pakistan's terror funding policy, it is also for the international community to keep a check on such terror financing structures and dismantle them by putting sanctions over terrorism sponsoring states. Despite being in the grey list of terror financing watchdog Financial Action Task Force, Pakistan has failed miserably in curbing terror funding. Hence, if it continues to finance terror outfits, the day is not far when it will be blacklisted for its support to terrorism. After the months-long stalemate of intra-Afghan negotiations, the Afghan government and the Taliban finally agreed to initiate the long-awaited peace talks after resolving the dispute over prisoner release. However, the chances of peace returning to the war-torn nation are still hanging on a thread, as the Islamist group has not put a halt to its offensive against Afghan security forces. And now, with several news reports accusing the Taliban of blatantly violating the terms of the Afghan peace deal by attacking military bases of US forces in Afghanistan, the hopes for a successful peace agreement between the two warring sides appear even darker, a report. Frantic efforts are being made to clear the way for intra-Afghan talks, a critical next step forward in the execution of the US-Taliban peace deal. In the latest development, Afghanistan's government has freed all but seven of the remaining hardcore Taliban inmates, whose release the Taliban had demanded as a precondition for negotiations. Earlier, Afghan President Ashraf Ghani was reluctant to release the remaining 320 prisoners unless the insurgents free the captured Afghan soldiers. Meanwhile, few more countries like France and Australia also urged Kabul not to release these prisoners as they have been convicted of serious violent attacks on foreign citizens. But now, as the last hurdle in the efforts to bring peace in Afghanistan has been removed, Afghan negotiators and Taliban are soon expected to open long-awaited talks in Qatar to negotiate a sustainable ceasefire and a political settlement to years of conflict in Afghanistan. Agreement that uh, President Ghani has been forced to sign is not the best of agreements for Afghanistan is concerned. It is clear that he has signed this under duress uh, to provide a face-saving way out for the Americans to exit uh, Afghanistan without having to show the world that they have been defeated. They have not been defeated. The fact is, 
they tried to defeat the uh, Taliban and they have not been successful because their tactics and strategies, the Taliban will find the present Afghan government a very hard nut to crack. So if the Taliban believes that with the exit of the Americans, they have scored a great victory, they will find out this is not the case. Amid the United States ramped up efforts to bring the two warring sides on the negotiating table, the Taliban is not putting a halt to an all-out offensive on the battleground. The insurgent group agreed not to attack American and NATO coalition forces, but it continues to target Afghan forces. In a recent wave of violence, the Taliban launched a complex attack on a military base in the eastern city of Gardez, killing three police officers and wounding five others. <laughs> Another obstacle on the way towards peace is the Taliban's reluctance to condemn Al-Qaeda and other Pakistan-based terror outfits. Under the landmark peace deal between the Taliban and the United States, the insurgent group pledged to sever all ties with Al-Qaeda and other terror groups before the total withdrawal of U.S. troops. However, a United Nations report released in June this year revealed that the Taliban still maintains close links to Al-Qaeda and also sought its advice during recent negotiations with U.S. officials. The report also revealed that the Haqqani network, a lethal military arm of the Taliban, in cooperation with Al-Qaeda, is planning to form a new terror group in the region. Now, where the Taliban is concerned, we know that they are aligned to the Pakistanis. Our worry is the Taliban acting as a front paw for the Pakistanis, and they will do things which are not in Afghanistan's interest, they are in Pakistan's interest. So if they take over Afghanistan, and in my opinion that's a very remote possibility, there will be problems. But as long as they are clearly Pakistan's agents in Afghanistan, I think once the Americans exit Afghanistan, the Afghan government, if they are supported by the world community through resources, should be able to tackle the Taliban far more comfortably than we have hitherto suspected. Meanwhile, the United States is keen to see the peace process move forward so it can withdraw U.S. troops as soon as possible. The U.S.-Taliban peace deal paves the way for withdrawing of all foreign forces from Afghanistan by the end of May 2021. According to President Donald Trump, there would be fewer than 5,000 American troops in Afghanistan by Election Day in November. However, both Kabul and Washington are unsure over the question where the peace will definitely return to the region once the foreign forces depart from the war-torn country. Let's now move to Pakistan, which has been facing major heat from the international community for its constant failures at fermenting terrorism. The country has been snubbed several times in front of the international community for spreading propaganda and lies, but has still not learned its lesson. In yet another embarrassment, Islamabad's attempts to get two internationals Angara Apaji and Gobinda Patnaik designated as terrorists under the 1267 Committee for Counter-Terrorism Sanctions of UNSC failed miserably as the move was blocked by the United States, UK, France, Germany and Belgium. Earlier, they put a hold on the listing demanding proofs but Pakistan failed to furnish any evidence to back up its fabricated allegations. The move came after the New Delhi managed to get Jesh Mohammed's chief Masood Azhar designated as global terrorist last year. And this is not the first time that Pakistan has resorted to false claims on international platforms. Earlier, it had conspired to get two other Indians designated as terrorists, but the attempt fell flat at that time too. To talk more on this, we are now joined by Mr. Rahul Bhosle, an expert in South Asian security issues. 
Mr. Bhosle, Pakistan has once again failed in its attempt to malign India's image at global level as it could not garner the support of the international community on listing of two Indians as international terrorists. What exact situation do you see Pakistan finding itself in? Over the years, Pakistan has been trying to deflect the, the attention it has gained for being the hub of global terror an exporter of terror, not only towards India, but across the world. Towards this end, it has made many attempts, including abduction of our former Navy, naval commander, Kulbushan Jado from Iran, getting him into the Balochistan and the tribal areas and has sentenced him to death under false charges. Now, as we see, it is tried to do this again in the United Nations Security Council by naming two Indians as involved in terrorist attacks and it has received a major snub. It very clearly highlights that Pakistan's attempts to portray that it is a victim of terror has been de denied and not accepted by the international community. Do you see this step as an attempt to take revenge from India against Masood Azhar sanctioning? There is a definitely a, a sense one gets that uh, this, this attempt by Pakistan to get two Indians uh, to be named uh, on the ban list by the United Nations uh, Security Council has links with India's attempts to get Masood Azhar, the infamous terrorist leader of Jaish e Mohammed, banned by the United Nations Security Council. It is regrettable that a terrorist of such high disrepute as Masood Azhar has been fostered by Pakistan over the years and now that he has been banned by the United Nations Security Council after intense efforts by India and other members who supported it, such as the United States and France. Now Pakistan has taken possibly a different stand, trying to portray that even Indians are, act, are, 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 are terrorists and they are trying to export terror into Pakistan. But then this charge has been there for some time. Nobody has accepted it. International community has always been rejecting this charge. The Pakistan government has approved a number of laws including the United Nations Security Council Amendment Bill and the Anti-Terrorism Act Amendment to meet the criteria by FATF. Do you think Pakistan is serious about taking actions against terrorism or it will brush this off as a technical formality done only to keep FATF at bay as the review is in September? In the last few years, Pakistan has been trying hard to be get away from the grey list of the Financial Action Task Force. Recently, we find that the Pakistan National Assembly and the Senate have passed a number of bills which are related to the Financial Action Task Force in an attempt the Pakistan is trying to get out of the grey list. Once it is, uh, the other reason is because it is economically under very severe constraints. Even Saudi Arabia is now denying assistance to Pakistan. So it is important for it to get out of the grey list. And a, land, a number of bills have been now projected in the National Assembly. They have been, some of them have been passed, some are still left. On the whole, however, it should be noted that despite all these efforts, Pakistan's proxy terror campaign in India and Afghanistan will continue. Thank you so much, Mr. Bhosle, for joining us. With that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We'll be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at nin.com. This is Shreya Sabajay signing off on the behalf of entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.